Hello, my name is Eric Lantris, and I'm going to bring you today the ultimate SEO writing program. So today we're going to be talking about the words on the page. And ironically, the words on the page are often the most neglected part of search engine optimization. No one really talks about how the words on the page impact your rankings. And trust me, they do. They do a lot. In fact, the words on the page can be the most important thing in your rankings. And there really isn't, as far as I could tell, anyone that covers how to write, what to write, and how to really structure it. So this is an in-depth look. This is, will be advanced for some, and I will also cover the basics. So I'll cover the whole screw. And this is also a summary because um, I could go a lot more into depth, but this should get you started and should get you going. So this will be um, a must hear or must go through for pretty much anyone that's doing SEO. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Let's dive right into it. Today, we're going to be covering the words that produce the highest rankings. We're going to be looking at negative footprints and positive footprints as well. I'm going to give you a lot of techniques. I'm going to give you a lot of examples. I'm even going to give you kind of a recipe for getting, for writing some content that will rank really well. Uh, one thing I want to know is that we're going to be covering the words. So I'm not going to be talking about the on page like elements and all that I'm gonna be talking about the words and it, it pretty much exclusively the words that you write so that's gonna be one of the differences I won't be talking about a table of content I won't be talking about like hey put an image here I'm gonna be talking about the words and yeah I think we get the point all right so number one rule about SEO today is forget all about the older rules so a lot of times when I see people writing for SEO what they do is they take the rules that we used to have in 2011 or prior and they keep on repeating that. So number one thing I see is do not keyword stuff, do not keyword stuff, do not repeat the same thing over and over and over again. And I generated this little Bart Simpson, I will not keyword stuff when I write for Google. So I don't know how much more I could drive this point across. You actually lose points when you repeat things over and over instead of gaining points. So you don't need to have the keyword um, 10 times in the first paragraph. You don't need to have the keyword in every single H1 and H2. You don't need to have all that. The basics, and this is really, um, I, I, won't, I don't want to say less is more, but here are the basics that you want to have. You want to have a good balance. So you want to have a title that has a keyword. So definitely have the keyword in the title. And on top of that, having a keyword at the beginning still helps even more. So that rule stays the same. Um, you want to have an H1 title that is relevant to the keyword. So gone are the days where you need to have your H1 as the main keyword. In fact, the most competitive terms like by Viagra are often not using by Viagra in the H1. So a lot of the high, high, high competition don't have the exact match keyword in the H1 anymore. That's a big change. So what you need by that, you could still have the keyword somewhere in your H1. Having a natural H1 with a keyword is perfectly fine. In fact, it's encouraged, but you don't need to have your exact match uh, H1 as your keyword anymore. That's, that's gone. Um, the other thing is multiple subtitles. That's very important, H2s, so that are relevant to the keyword. That is going to be another basic. And that's not, we're not going to be going over titles and subtitles too much. We're going over the content. But this is what I want to throw out there is that um, you, here's the structure, you know, have a title and have the keyword in there. The H1 does not need to have the keyword. And in fact, if you don't want to put it, I'd recommend putting the keyword in some one of your H2s and you'll rank very well with that. So that is now for the content so um if you for the i think the hardest thing for a lot of people and this might be why some people say seo is dead is the hardest thing is not to learn how to rank today but the hardest thing is to unlearn the things that we've learned in the past so to like not do the things that we did in 2009 when we we're writing an article or rank now we have to we have to do something completely different and that's for new people coming in this is easy but for people that have been doing seo for a long time a lot of them are now doing Facebook ads because it's just really hard to not do something that you've been trained. Anyways, so enough rambling about that. Let's jump into the actual content. For pretty much the entirety of this, we're going to be thinking like a robot and we're going to be picking out the important words. That's the first concept in ranking on Google. So I'm not really, I'm not really going to be talking about being creative and getting your readers to convert. This is all about ranking. So to rank, 
you need to think like a robot. Um, you need to think about what Google is looking for and what they want to find on the page and what they're going to determine your pages should rank for. So here's the example. Robots, like the Google bot, when they're scanning your content, trying to figure out what they should rank it for, they ignore the common words such as the, he, she, that, a, and so forth. So all the common words are not really going to register when Google is looking for relevance. Instead, what they're looking for is going to be the important words. So what I mean by the important words is, let's say we have a human, like we have a, the sentence that we just use naturally, and the dog ate a bone. That's that's completely that's that's the human whatever. Um, but the robots, like the Google bot, will pick out the important words. The words that are you know unique and important. So dog ate bone. That is going to be what Google associates in terms of what's important in there. So they're going to be like, okay, this page is about a dog eating a bone. Um, the, the actual analysis is when you're analyzing and figuring out the relevance, they're also going to include the synonyms, which is another thing. So uh, whether you write dog or dogs or canine, Google's going to assume the same thing. They're trying to break down and they take the important words and they kind of group them with synonyms when they're analyzing all your uh, all your content, which is one of the reasons why when people use uh, spinners and they just replace all the synonyms, and now it's not working because Google recognizes that as being pretty much the same content. So um, as a robot, like I give the example, um, what the robot sees is the dogs, uh, dog, dog, dogs, canine, eating, ate, food, bone, bones. So you could test this right now if you want. You could go to Google search and if you type in dog ate bone and then you type in canine ate bone, you'll get nearly the same results. They're very, very similar. And that's because Google knows that dog is pretty much the equivalent to canine. So they know it's a synonym. They know and, and you know, for as a general whole, the results will be very, very, very similar because Google understands. So even if you type in canine ate bone, they're still gonna give you the same results that are using dog, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're feeding Google some uh, words and when you're writing for Google, Google knows the synonyms and Google will ignore all the um, the and he and she and I have a list actually on the right hand side of the most frequently used words. So all those are pretty much going to be ignored and Google's only going to pick out the important words. So that is what you want to keep in mind as a general rule for everything that you write, titles, um, headlines and subheadlines and the actual main content. Okay, so when you are determining and when you want to tell Google what you're writing about, you want to find all the important words and we're going to call these theme words that will determine the relevance. So Google's going to find and the way to, the way Google approaches this is they look for not just one word, but they look for a group of uncommon words frequently used together to determine relevance. What that means is if you're using dog, canine, pet, uh, care, you're looking your pedigree, collar, all those words and you those are all grouped together when people are talking about dogs. So that, that this collection of words in a theme is going to be called the footprint. So your page, all the, your, Google's going to analyze your page, look at all the important words, and if a lot of, if many of those important words are related to dogs uh, within their, their database, they're going to associate your page being related to dogs. So that's why it's really important if you want to rank for dogs, you need to include many, many, many um, words, important words that are going to be related to dogs. So for instance, if I were to write a human sentence, just a normal sentence, when the dog ate a bone in front of the other dogs in the kennel, the alpha dog of the group growled, his master blew the dog whistle. That sentence right there provides a ton of relevance for um, dogs. The Google algorithm will pick up all the important words, they'll ignore things like when, the, and all that, and they're going to pick out all the important words and um, realize that they're all part of the same group. They're all part of the dog group. So if you want to rank for anything dog related, that sentence will help you rank for all the things dog related. Um, so if the reason I'm talking about this is because a lot of people don't put in enough words 
with uh, enough important words on a certain theme. If you want to talk about dogs, but then you go out and you have a whole story about um, Lacey and how she, you know, you went to the park with her and you had a great time and, you know, your buddies came over and then it's not really about dogs. You don't have those words. Google won't know. A reader might understand that, you know, it's all about Lacey and that was your favorite dog and, you know, you went to the, you know, you went to the park with her. But Google's going to see park. They're going to see Lacey, which could be a girl's name. They might, they won't know if you're talking about a girlfriend or if you're talking about yeah, a dog or whichever. So it could be a whole story about a dog, but Google won't know unless you start putting in those important footprint ter uh, terms. So the theme terms. So that's something else you want to keep in the back of your mind. We're going to get to more concrete and how to use this in a, very, in a few seconds. But just for now, know that whenever you're using a lot of theme words, so a lot of words that are within the context of that category, so within the context of, let's say, dogs or cooking or fishing or whatever you want to use, that whole collection is going to provide a footprint. And we're going to be calling that a positive footprint. So you want to ignore all the common words and focus on the important words. Um, so here's how we're going to do it. Here's kind of like the recipe. The first thing you want to do is, this is even before you start writing, is going to be to write an outline of the article. And the reason we're doing this is because it it's going to make everything else easier. And it's going to be one of the most important things. This is our research in order to write some good content. So this is what I say, the broad strokes. We're going to have the outlines. And the outline is basically our recipe. The outline is going to help us cover all the elements that Google expects to find. So if you want to write a really high ranking pay for a really high ranking page, you're going to want to have the H2s that provide relevance to Google. You're going to want to have H2, so sub headlines, that are, are what Google are looking for. And the only way to really provide that, or the best way I find to provide that, is going to do it in advance. And we're actually going to show you how I do it in just a second. So the way I do it is, I first do a search for the keyword. So I will just go into Google and whatever I want to do. So in this case, since we're doing fishing poles, I'm going to type in fishing poles and I'm going to look at the top 10 results that, that are um, listed. When you browse the top 10 results, just write all the important words within those top 10 results. You'll see. Um, so first one, you'll see fishing rods, you'll see fishing poles, you'll see base, um, you'll see um, what is it? Oh my God, fishing reels. You'll have tons and tons of important words that keep on repeating and repeating. And then whenever they're repeating um, frequently, you could assume that that is going to be one of the theme words. So that is going to be my first um, first way of determining what the theme words are. And then the second thing is I always look for the Wikipedia article. Wikipedia is amazing because they pretty much have a an article on everything and they have an amazing table of content. If you look up the table of content, that is pretty much going to be your main guide. If uh, Wikipedia tables of content are often, you know, they end up being the theme words that you want to go after. So that, that's one of the things you want to find. The other thing that I use is going to be Google AdWords where I go and you just by the, if you use a default setting in Google AdWords, there's a thing called ideas. And this is really, you put in your keyword in there and it's going to give you related ideas. And these related ideas will talk about different categories and what they find, they expect to find in there. Last, but certainly not least at the bottom of the page, you have a related suggestions from Google. So a lot of times I will go and I'll see what Google suggests. So in this instance, Google is suggesting fishing poles for beginners. And that is one of the things that um, Google might look for inside an article. So they might look for beginners, advanced, uh, medium. They, they might look for a lot of things. So I'm going to show you what I came up with. And this, you know, this concrete example might help. Okay, so this is what I built with the top 10 concept, looking at Wikipedia and all that. Uh, I would start off the article with beginner fishing rods all around fishing rods for the common fish, river fishing rods, and I would maybe expand a bit more. Then I'd have the design of the poles because a lot of places talked about the design and how you know different designs have different um, reactions. Um, I talk about power and action, which is fishing uh, pole specific. 
it's kind of like the way you swing it and the way it bounces back. Um, I talk about carbon rods because those are very uh, very uh, popular these days, fly rods. I talk about lures as well, poles for different fishes and pole recommend, fishing pole recommendations. All of these H2s and all this article stuff revolves around fishing poles. So when Google goes through this database and this whole list of words, they'll see rods a lot of the time, they'll see fishing poles, they're like, wow, this is really about fishing poles. You'll see that in not every H2, but many of the H2, I'm either either mentioning rods or poles or a pole or different lures, the materials, my recommendation, and I do use different words and different terminology, but it's always around the same subject. It's always complementary or very close to it. And this is obviously not the perfect um, outline, but it is a very good start. <laughs> so if you want to write and rank about fishing poles, this is a good start. Obviously, you know, if, if you were an expert on fishing uh, poles, then you could probably write a better one. And I hope you're an expert in your whatever you're writing. Um, I, I'm definitely not. So this is the outline you want to have. And this ends up being my H2. And also because I love embedding tables of content like Wikipedia style, this would also be my table of content whenever people land on my page. That means that all the links, all these would end up being internal links to different sections of my article. And this is one of the secret sauces to ranking. This is really getting your H2s with a ton of relevance and it will just make everything easier. A lot of times what people use as H2s, like let me just show you the alternate example, is people will use things that have absolutely no relevance. They'll have uh, an H2 such as conclusion, which tells Google nothing. They'll have something like, um, here's what we think as an H2 or find out more as an H2 or they'll have like really abstract generic H2s that really don't tell Google what you're ranking or what you should be ranking for and these instead will serve as um, extreme relevance. So this is some of the words that I will use and some of the sections that I will be writing about to provide ultimate relevance. Okay, now we're going to dive in to writing the actual first draft. So what are the new rules, kind of like the 2015 rules? Well, here are the basics. The start of the content should be very heavy in words relating to the main keyword. So let, let me just go back like a few. Remember this sentence? When a dog ate a bone in front of the other dogs in a kennel and the alpha dog of the group growled, he messed his master, blew the whistle. Now, that's obviously an extreme example, right? That that is putting a lot, you know, putting a lot, a lot, a lot of um, r related words. You don't need to go that much in depth. But in the first paragraph, you want to have many, many, you want to have many words um, that are going to be theme words, you want to make, you know, have a lot of create a really positive footprint right off the bat. So as soon as the Google starts scanning the page and reading the page, you're all about whatever keyword you are writing, you want to ideally use the exact match keyword once somewhere near the beginning of the article. I find that this still does work. You still get a bit more power if you use it once somewhere in the body of the text. And please, you do not need to bold it. You do not need to have it like right at the beginning. Just use it naturally somewhere near the beginning. And on top of that, um, you want to use it naturally if it's possible to use it naturally. If it's um, if it's a weird keyword that you can't fit into the English language, you do not need to use it um, exactly how it is. You could use a very close variation, and it'll make sense. So um, that rule has, you know, still applies, but make sure it's natural and try to have the exact keyword somewhere in the first paragraph. That will be ideal, and it'll help you rank even more. Um, after the first paragraph, so as you start getting into it and start writing, you can be much more lenient and just write about the subject. Here's the thing, because we did the table of content, uh, you're going to be writing uh, on that content. So if you have a, um, a sub, a, you know, sub headline uh, that talks about carbon fiber fishing rods, then anything that you write about carbon fiber fishing rods should naturally fit into the whole group and whole uh, idea and it, it will provide relevance and which is that's why we do the the outline first it's to make sure we're headed in the right direction um, a lot of times when we don't write a, an outline you might just go on a, out on a tangent 
and I tend to do that a lot, might just go out on a tangent and that will, you'll lose a bit of relevance. So the better, best way to do it is really table of content first then just write and fill in the table of content. Okay, it's gonna start getting interesting uh, even more now. So the first revision, uh, one, once you have your first draft, so that, that was just the first draft, now we're gonna have our first revision. The first revision is just a few little checks. All right, so just go through this and ask yourself, are the subheadlines relevant to the keyword? So that's, you should have that, but just make sure once you've written the whole thing that is that it is. Um, does the first paragraph contain a keyword or a very close variation? Are you using heavy amounts of related terms in the first paragraph? Uh, does the overall text contain a lot of theme specific keywords? Like, you know, the words import that, the important words that we were talking about. And did you follow the outline that you put forward? So that's kind of like a first check. That's your first revision once you've written your draft. Um, after that, we're going to be doing a second revision. The second revision is going to be what I call the hummingbird tweak. And that hummingbird is going to be an algorithm that Google put out. And it it's trying to make the algorithm intelligent. It's trying to make the algorithm understand what you're trying to do instead of just looking for blatant keywords. So what I mean by that is Google is now trying to answer queries. Um, if you ask Google a question, it's going to try to find the answer for you and not just look for your question on the web. There's a slight difference there. It's very important. So now it's evolved. So it's looking and it's trying to rank the highest. Um, it's trying to rank the, the pages with the answer the highest. So if the query is what's the best poutine in Montreal, the Google will reward pages with answers such as the best poutine in Montreal is my favorite poutine is the best poutine is um, all those snippets of text indicate an answer. So Google, if you're asking a question to Google, and there's many types of queries, but if you're asking a question to Google, Google is going to try to find an answer. Now, before Hummingbird, Google just tried to find your question. See, see the difference? Google would find other people asking the question. And that wasn't really useful because people are looking for an answer. So now the, the difference is that when you ask a, uh, a question to Google, if it's not going to find more questions, it's going to try to find your answer. And if it can't find anything else and it can't find an answer, then what it's going to do, it's just going to show you more people asking a question. But ideally, it's looking for the answer for you. So if you are providing the answer to the query, you're going to rank higher. Now, this applies for questions, but it also applies for many, many, many other queries that we're going to go for. And we know that Google is doing this because of, first of all, the rankings and also the knowledge graph. Sometimes the knowledge graph will provide the exact answer that we're looking for. So here are some examples for different types of keywords, different types of niches, different types of queries. So if we have the keyword, how to get your ex back, that's kind of like a question, right? So there's the how. So it's looking for the answer to get your ex back, to get back with your ex. Um, all those variations will indicate that you're answering the question. Google will rank that higher. Uh, if you put in, let's say, a very information-based uh, word, such as Vancouver real estate, it's looking for examples of that. It wants to make sure you're presenting Vancouver real estate. So here are some of Vancouver's finest real estate will be an answer that Google's going to say, okay, well, these guys are presenting what the person is looking for. Um, you could also start describing it. So Vancouver's finest real estate is, that will also provide um, some, some relevance and some answers. You see, naturally, if you were just writing about it, you would probably get this by yourself, right? Like some, some of this might, you might already be, do, be doing, and I hope that you're already doing it, but sometimes it's not, not so obvious. So let's say you're looking for the best phone in 2015. The answer and what it's looking for is the best phone in 2015 is, or even something like our favorite phone is, things like fishing pole, uh, Google's gonna be looking for a fishing pole is, or fishing poles are used, kind of like an explanation. And let's say you're going, doing reviews, and you're looking, I was gonna put a, an actual product name, but I was like, okay, ClickBank product review, and you're, that's the keyword. So let's say it's uh, make a million dollars a day, ClickBank product review. Um, then Google will be looking for proof that you reviewed it. So it'll be, and our the conclusion of our review is, or the verdict is that 
ClickBank product X works well, or we like, or we recommend, it'll look for uh, words that are related to review to prove that you have reviewed it or not. So Google, I don't, actually I don't have all the data on how in depth this has gone, um, but we do know, especially, um, I've had a few friends that were doing testing with questions, and whenever there were questions, whenever you'd provide answers, that was always ranking higher. So this is kind of like a, a secret trick that we could use whenever you're trying to write your content. If you write the content and you answer questions, or let's say you're asking questions that could also help, um, that will help you rank higher. So um, that is something that you're gonna wanna implement when you're doing revision number two. Make sure you're answering the query. All right, step number three, and this is a really, really, really easy one, is Google has a grammar algorithm. Um, everyone knows that, I think. And all you need to do is use Grammarly.com to correct the spelling and the grammar. So even if humans can read your text, sometimes we have, you know, things make sense. So you have slang and all that, but we're not writing for humans right now, at least not in this whole like program that I'm talking about. We're writing for search engines and we're writing to rank as high as possible. So with that in mind, you wanna get the highest a score possible within from the Google algorithm. And the Google algorithm will return the highest score for perfect writing. So ideally, you just wanna plug your stuff into Grammarly and get perfect writing. It doesn't hurt, it's not very hard. Um, the only issue with Grammarly is that sometimes it doesn't recognize all the industry terms. So there are some things that you might wanna leave in there, but otherwise you're gonna to want to make sure that your writing is correct and your, your grammar is, is proper as well. Um, this is usually this ends up being an issue a lot of the times. I end up, you know, I write articles and I plug them in there. I'm like, wow, I I, I cannot write. Um, even though I thought I, you know, I don't think I'm a horrible writer, but I just fixed a ton of things. And at the end of the day, I have a robot coaching me on how to beat the other robot. So this is really what it is. Grammarly is coaching you on how to defeat. Uh, Google's grammar robot. So if Grammarly says you have a 100% score, then the Google bot will likely say you have a 100% score and at the end of the day, you'll rank higher. So you know what? I will go to path of least resistance. This is kind of like a little cheat, a grammar cheat that ranks that lets you rank higher. Okay, um, the next thing is going to be increasing relevance. So that's gonna be another spice that you put on top of that. So once you've corrected your grammar, you've answered the query, you have all that, now you're ready for the advanced tweaking. And this is um, this is really interesting so far. So you could use ntopic.org for advanced relevance. What they do is you paste in all your content and they'll evaluate your content, give you a score based on the relevancy. So all they'll say, okay, how close are you to using all the theme keywords that we were finding and all the ones that Google is ranking right now? What they do on top of that and let me just show you an example of it in use, is they'll give you suggestions as well. They'll say like, look, you forgot this, and this was on a lot of the pages that we found. So what you could do is you could go out and discover new theme keywords that you might have missed and then sprinkle them into your content. And then once you've done that, recalculate your score. So ideally using Entopic, you wanna get a score of 99%. When you do that, that means that Google is gonna have the utmost uh, find the utmost relevance in your article. You're gonna, it's, you're gonna see all this stuff on the red. These are all suggestions and they're saying, you, don't, you just don't have enough. And you know, your competition's mentioning this a lot more and they're messaging this and it, like implementing this and you're gonna wanna step it up. So that is one way of really um, improving the relevance of your content. And this ends up helping you um, build relevance whenever you're missing some. I use this all the time for the, um, when I'm optimizing pages that I wanna rank really well for, and I forget things. I just forget things all the time. Usually I'm very good, because I've been writing for a long time, but then I'm like, oh yeah, I was writing about, what was it? I was writing about drones, and I forgot to mention uh, quadcopter. And I was like, oh man, that's, that's a very, very obvious term if you're writing about that subject. And you know, I was just like, oh man, I just, I should probably put that in there, right? So yeah, this will help you a lot whenever you are, uh, you're working on that. 
So that's going to be the next step is spice your content up, add words as the words that you're that you're you're missing. OK, so after that, this is where it gets completely bonkers. It gets crazy. There is a positive footprint. So all the theme keywords that we were talking about. And now just to screw with your mind, there is negative footprints and negative footprints is how Google determines if you're just writing the same crap as everyone else or if you're providing added value and presenting a new angle. So negative footprints is finally it's using unique words that are exclusive to your page. This is important and this is something that I think is a world first that I've never heard anyone else talk about this ever. Um, and this will give you a huge advantage. So whenever you finish adding all the relevant content and all the relevant words, so you have all the words, you know, all the, the power words and the theme words, what you want to do is you want to have unique words that are only you that are unique to your page. And they will that will show Google that you have a higher quality article than everyone else. So if you take all the most common words and density as your competition and that's all you have google's going to assume that you just copied your competition this is kind of how this is one of the ways they co they combat text spinning because whenever you take the text spinning you get like a bunch of articles with the nearly exactly the same keyword density and the same um theme keywords and pretty much the footprint is the same positive footprint as everyone else and they don't stand out in any way so google assumes that there's no added value, why would they rank that article compared to another article when they're pretty much the same thing? If you're using the same words, the same combination or same group of words on one side and you're using the same exact combination on the other side, it's probably mentioning the same thing, probably has the same conclusion. Google has no incentive to rank for it. Instead, what they're looking for is a new angle and a new point of view. And that is what is going to make you rank higher than anyone else. So what Google looks for is all the unique words in your article that aren't commonly found on all the other pages on all the other uh, articles. So they want that new angle. And that is going to be they're going to determine that by you using words that they don't find in top 10 results uh, right now. So let me give you an example. So if the top 10 are all using uh, positive footprints, right? Fishing, poles, rod, base, uh, bass, I mean, those all count, count towards your positive footprint. If you want to improve your negative footprint, which is something that you do want to improve, um, you also want to give Google a brand new unique angle. And you might use words such as deep sea angler, sturgeon fish, carbon fiber reinforced polymer, graphite reinforced polymers, velocity. These are all advanced words and those are likely to be unique to your page. Now, the first two are, you know, specific types of fish. The second and third are going to be the um, an advanced description of the material in the fishing rods. So a generic uh, article won't use these words. A generic article should just say like, oh, yeah, it's a pole, it's a rod, it's made out of carbon, whatever. It, it won't go into depth into what it is made, how the structure is and all that. And that is going to be providing you unique words that aren't found on the other articles. And Google's going to reward that and rank your article higher. So if you've ever wondered why, you know, $5 articles that are written, you know, like someone pops out, you know, 400 articles for like, you know, $400 and those don't really rank. This is why it's because Google has the algorithm that detects higher quality whenever you go more into depth and you use unique words and unique content that aren't found anywhere else. Also, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that they're relevant. You want to make sure that you're just they're relevant because you're dive, you're 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 going more in depth. You're not just using random words uh, left and right. I'm not sure if random words would work as well. They might, but you want to go more in depth so that your content actually makes sense. And I'll show you how I do it. It's actually not that difficult. So step number seven is you want it. Um, you want to dive deeper into the topic and provide more depth and detail about the information. So go back to the content and go back to your revisions now and then just go more in depth and explain more. This will naturally use uh, lead to using unique words. You won't have a choice if you're going to explain, you know, the material and more in depth of the material Then you 
you're going to you're going to have to go and use words that the other guys aren't using and that's going to make you rank above all the other guys because they won't be doing that so for our information yeah for a fishing pole example i already talked about this i dive into carbon fiber and how it's made and all its variants and that is how google distinguishes low quality mass articles compared um, as opposed to well-researched content. So if you want Google quality, this is the negative footprints is um, how you do it. So congratulations uh, if you've gotten this far. You now know probably more than most people know about writing for SEO. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me in the support area. Always happy. Love your feedback. I've been getting some really great feedback these days. And show me your, you know, show me like your content that's ranking. Um, if you get some really good results, you want to share those with me. Say, oh, Eric, I moved up a few, few spots by doing this. Then just shoot them my way. By the way, just on a completely different side note, whenever you make um, content changes, it takes longer to for Google to reevaluate them than links. So content changes, whenever you make them on a site, if you just make a content change and just leave it as is, it might take a week or two weeks, as opposed to if you throw a backlink, you should see results a bit faster. But content changes, Google does, it, they take their time, right? So make the content changes and then a few weeks down the line, see, see what kind of ranking changes you get. Um, it's never instant with content changes for some reason. So I hope this has been useful. I am um, very happy to talk to you and I will talk to you soon.